Hey everyone, I was thinking about the definition of the derivative and how in a calculus course it shows up, you use it to establish some of the derivative rules like the product rule and the quotient rule, and then it kind of disappears until you have to actually take a test. But then the questions involving the definition of a derivative aren't really testing calculus concepts. They're more testing things like rationalizing a radical or working with complicated algebraic manipulation. So this begs the question, what is the definition of the derivative good for outside of these contexts? Well, today we're gonna to talk about this one problem right here that asks for the derivative of this function at x equals zero. Now you notice this function looks quite complicated. Different things are going on with it depending on what the value of x that you put into the function is. So we need some more interesting insight than just our typical derivative rules to actually approach it. So today we're gonna to talk about how the limit definition of the derivative can help us in situations precisely like this. So stay tuned to find out how. Hey, welcome to today's video, I'm Prof Omar. Today we're gonna to talk about the derivative at x equals zero of this really interesting function. That's 3x squared when x is rational and negative 5x squared when x is irrational. So to get a sense of what this graph might look like, it's kind of like the function when graph is bouncing between two parabolas. So when x is rational, we get 3x squared. So we get points that look like this. But then when x is irrational, we get negative 5x squared. So we get something like this. Right? And so this function is constantly bouncing between these two things. Now, traditional methods for finding the derivative would employ something like a power rule, or if we had a product of functions, a product rule, or things like that. But here we're in this interesting situation where the function keeps bouncing between these two parabolas, so we can't really see what's going on with the derivative at zero. But this is a perfect example of why the limit definition of a derivative is great. So we're gonna use that to figure out indeed what f prime of zero is. Now before doing this with this specific problem, what I'd like to do is look at a problem that's not as complicated as this in terms of being broken up when x is rational and x is irrational, different, have, having different values, um, and look at something that doesn't oscillate as much, but employ the same idea to find the derivative at zero. So the function I wanna look at is this function right here f of x, which is x squared sine 1 over x if x is non-zero. Now you notice something about this. When x is zero, this would be undefined because you'd have zero in the denominator of this fraction here. And then it's gonna be zero at x equals zero. That's how we fill in that gap. And the question here is can we actually compute what f prime of zero is? Okay, if we look at this at face value, it's not clear exactly what to do. We can differentiate when we're away from zero, but at zero, we don't exactly know what's going on. So this is where the advantage of using the limit definition of the derivative comes in. So the limit definition for the derivative at zero is the limit as h approaches zero of f at zero plus h minus f of zero all over h. And before diving into the computation to seeing what this limit is, uh, what I want to do is remind ourselves where this comes from. So if you had a general graph, not of this function particularly here, but of a general function, so let's say I draw a function like this. So here is the graph of y equals f of x for a general function f. This point here is the point zero f of zero. Now, the geometric interpretation of the derivative is that it's supposed to be the slope of this tangent line right over here. Okay, and a way that you can approximate that is by coming very, very close along the graph. So picking a point here that's a little bit far from zero. So we'll pick zero plus a little constant h. Here h has, happens to be negative, that's okay. The y-coordinate of this point then will be f of zero plus h. And this line here, called a secant line, approximates this tangent line. And as this point gets closer and closer and closer to our original point here, meaning that h is getting closer to zero, 
this tangent line will be approximated by these secant lines. And so the slope of the tangent, which is the derivative at zero, is approximated by the slope of these lines, which we can see explicitly by comparing um, these two points. And the slope is gonna be the difference in the y values, which is f of zero plus h minus f of zero, divided by the difference in the x values, which is zero plus h minus zero. And that's where we get the h in the denominator. Okay. So now that we recall the intuition from where this is coming from, let's actually do the computation and see what happens with this limit, with this particular function here, as a way to learn what to do with the more complicated function we had to begin with. Okay, so here's our derivative at zero. If we simplify things here, f of zero is zero according to how it's defined. So this is eliminated and we're left with the limit as h approaches zero of f of h over h. Okay, so when we're dealing with limits, we never think about h being actually zero. These are values of h that we're looking at that are very, very, very close to zero. And then looking at what happens to this expression here for those values h that are really close to zero. Now this function is x squared sine one over x anywhere x is not zero. So this numerator is gonna be for any h close to zero, h squared sine one over h. And so we get this expression here. Now dividing the h's, we have that the derivative at zero is the limit as h approaches zero of h sine one over h. And so our question is what happens to this expression here as h goes to zero? Now before actually answering that question of figuring out what this limit does, let's think about what we just did because it actually brings up a really good point here. Right, so the derivative at zero, we looked at the limit definition of derivative to express that as a limit of some function, right? And we're able now to transfer to a problem about limits to figure out what this derivative actually is at zero. Okay, so let's examine this limit right over here. Through our computations thus far, we said that f prime of zero is this limit right over here. Now let's think about what's happening with this function right over here. Sine of one over h oscillates between negative one and one. And so this quantity here is oscillating between values that are at most h and negative h for a particular value of h. Now, the thing that's tricky about this is that h could be positive, which means h dominates this and negative h um, is dominated by this but h could also be negative in which the inequalities are gonna be reversed. So what we could do then is take absolute values to make sure things are okay. So if we look at the absolute value of this quantity by the sort of heuristic we just talked about, this value here, because it's between negative one and one, this entire absolute value is bounded above by the absolute value of h, and then it's also bounded below by negative the absolute value of h. Uh, okay, so what's happening to these expressions? As h goes to zero, this quantity goes to zero, and this quantity goes to zero as well. So this quantity right over here is bounded above and below by two functions that approach zero as h goes to zero. By the squeeze theorem, that means that this entire thing here is going to zero. So the absolute value of h sine one over h goes to zero as h goes to zero. Now, because the absolute value of something is going to zero, then the actual argument itself is going to zero. This wouldn't be true if this thing was approaching, say, three. If the absolute value was approaching three, it could be that the function itself oscillates between values near three and near negative three. Right? But because the absolute value is bounded above and below by things going to zero, the absolute value goes to zero and the absolute value will be jumping between things that are positive or the actual function itself will be jumping between things that are positive and negative but near zero. And so this will actually approach zero itself. So this piece here is approaching zero. That's the thing we're interested in finding the limit of. So the derivative of this function at zero actually is zero. So cool application of the limit definition of the derivative 
to be able to compute the derivative at zero of a function that's more complicated than we're used to. So let's see how that actually helps us with the function that we had earlier that was quite more complicated than what we see here. Okay, so here's our original function that we were dealing with. Let's go ahead and use the limit definition of the derivative to look at what f prime of zero is. So f prime of zero is the limit as h approaches zero of f at zero plus h minus f of zero, all divided by h. Now let's look at these pieces right over here. Here we have f of zero. Zero is a rational number, and so f of zero is three times zero squared, which is zero. And so we're left here with f of h over h as the thing we're interested in finding the limit of. So we need to investigate what this function looks like near zero. Now this function is oscillating between these two different parabolas. And so this function f of h over h takes on different values depending on where h lies. We'll have 3h squared if h is rational as a numerator, giving us 3h as the value of this quotient if h is rational. And then we'll have negative 5h if h is irrational. Now the thing you notice about both of these is we're interested in finding the limit as h approaches zero of this thing. And both these pieces seem to be going to zero, right? So let's make that concrete somehow. Um, let's think about a way to talk about this function holistically, instead of thinking about it in these two pieces where H is rational and H is irrational. Okay, inspired by the previous example that we have, a thing to look at is the absolute value of this thing and see if you can bound it above and below by things that are going to zero. So let's take a look at that. We have the absolute value of f of h over h. Okay, so when h is rational, this quantity right over here is gonna be bounded above by three times the absolute value of h and bounded below by three, the negative three times the absolute value of h. Similarly, when h is irrational, it's gonna be bounded above by five times the absolute value of h and bounded below by negative five times the absolute value of h. But five times the absolute value of h is larger than three times the absolute value of h. So this is definitely bounded above by five times the absolute value of h. Right? This is gonna hold when, this inequality is gonna hold when h is irrational, but it also happens to hold when h is rational because the constant here is smaller. And by a similar argument, this is gonna be bounded below by negative five times the absolute value of h. And now we're in good shape. h is going to zero, so these two both go to zero. And so, sort of by the same argument we used before, this is squeezed between two things going to zero, so the absolute value of this thing is going to zero as h goes to zero, which means this inside thing is going to zero as h goes to zero as well. And so our derivative that we're interested in is in fact zero at x equals zero. So cool idea, employing the limit definition of the derivative and seeing how it's useful in computing derivatives in situations where a derivative is not clear to compute. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, please click the like button. If you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.